another episode of Failure Friday, where we talk to friends, clients, and complete strangers about how failure has shaped them in their personal lives and in their career. I think it's a super important topic. I've gotten a lot of great feedback. Some of it I've, I've ignored, which is okay, I think, but uh, some of it I've taken to heart. And I just hope this keeps helping people. That's really the only point of it. I, I haven't gotten any business from it. I've gotten a few extra people that wanna come on the show, but all in all, the true reward comes from when I get those messages, those text messages, the DMs from people saying, I really needed to hear that. Thank you so much. And that's what I'm doing it for. So if you wanna come on, you can go ahead and shoot me a message. I have a short questionnaire I'll have you fill out and uh, then we'll get you scheduled if it's the right fit. Today we have a really cool guest. This is someone who I was around during the worst part of my life. It was about 10 years ago and he took me into his tattoo shops at the time. I, I could always draw, but I believed I could you know, start doing tattoos and I don't think I made much progress in that direction, but they were a community. They were a group of people the employees at the shop, Jaw himself, that really just embraced me during this really tough time, made me feel safe and that I belonged and just gave me a place to escape to. And I am forever grateful to him for that. I don't even, I don't even think he realizes what he did for me by bringing me into that environment, but I'm forever thankful. But today we have Jaw Beasley. He is the owner of Empire Business Group imperial brand and co-owner of empire tattoos and has many other business ventures and he's here to talk to us today about how failure has shaped him in his own life and how it continues to shape him and what it means to him just in general what failure feels like does it feel different to people that are not like us or that are close to us does it feel different to everyone and if so why and what are the outcomes we see from these different perceptions of failure. I'm very excited to have this conversation. Camera here, a camera here, and then I have you on my computer. So I do the intro with you, but I did the intro before on my phone. And um, in the intro, I talked about how like, I came to you guys when I was in the worst phase of my life. Like I was the worst. And you guys created this amazing community for me. And I'm forever thankful for that. That was Empire that was an awesome person. I don't know how many people can say that about Empire Tattoos, but that was my safe place. <laughs> <laughs> that was my that was my safe place. That's dope. I'm glad that you know you provided that type of atmosphere. Um, we tend to like mold and develop a lot of young, you know, adults growing up, and they come in there and they just have like life changing moments, and I did not know we left such a the impression on so many people, but um, it's humbling. You know what I mean? Like hearing people come back to me and say, "Hey, listen, man, like, what? Like, you know, why? why? You know, I guess providing a sort of structure, almost like a family atmosphere, and you know, lay down on them when I need to lay down on them, give them praise when they need it, and just you know, molding them into great people." trying my best to, you know, trying. embrace them and reinforce them. Yeah, no, and that was, that was some of my fondest memories was in that shop. Just, and just having, a, it felt like a family. It felt, it felt like everyone there was loyal. And I'm sure there was drama in the back end, like looking of back, course, but everyone at the end of the day loved each other. Right. And it, it was, Definitely. and the people we would meet that would come in there, I mean, walks of life, all kind of weird stuff. Some of the, the empire way. The craziest people watching I've ever seen in my life. But um thank you for that. I wanted I wanted to start that with start this with that. But um today's about failure. I'm sure you failed in your life, even though yeah. being around you, it just always felt like it was just success, success, success. Here comes Jaw and his crazy car. Um but I'm sure you have something to give back. I noticed on your Facebook page that you have a podcast. Tell me a little bit about that. Just going through like my experiences, you know, I'm very contained when it comes to talking to people. I don't talk to too many people. Um, I'm not comfortable with that. And I started this journey by going to therapy. And my 
therapist said I need to try different things. You're in therapy? Yeah, I had I had to do it. I had to do it. Like it's, it's a pivotal moment in your life where you start um realizing there was a lot of broken things in people and they don't know how to fix it and they go about just you know saying oh, i have nobody see that it's no big deal but it starts manifesting itself in your day-to-day -day if you don't acknowledge it so with the past of my mother like a lot of horrible you know traits and underlying things that i was just dealing with throughout that time just started spilling out onto the table and it was infecting everything around me and affecting you know the people that i love so um i had to do it i said i had to start to figure out a way uh, to fix myself and i'm not going to just sit down and be like oh yeah you know I'm, I'm cool. no, i know i was okay so i started that journey in therapy and you know it helps it helps to let you uh put everything out on the table in a unjudgmental and open platform and nobody's there, you know, picking at you or using what you're saying or how you're feeling is leverage. And you start working through your problem. I haven't quite gotten everything down yet, but it allowed me to uh, venture off into new things like this podcast, uh, Red Room Podcast, uh, Empire Podcast. And that was the new thing that I said I was going to try because I'd be with collective groups of friends. You already know how it was in Empire. We just shooting the breeze and talking. And people were like, man, you always have something good to say. You always have a point of view. And I wonder how people feel about it. And um, I just never the type to want to talk to people. So she was like, try it. I mean, see if it works. And you know, I, mean, I just pulled the trigger on things. I said, okay, I'm going to just start pricing things out. I'm going to do it in the following week. Empire Podcast. We're just going to try it. And now it's a thing where people are watching it every week or whenever it comes on and it's entertaining to them. Um, and I'm getting a little bit more comfortable with it as I'm sitting down here talking to you right now. Isn't that awesome? I'm proud of you because I would have, first of all, never put you in therapy ever in my life. I think the picture for people listening, Jaw is, how tall are you, Jaw? Six, seven. Big motherfucker. Right. <laughs> and when I, I knew you, you were like, <gasps> yeah, yeah. I had to trim up all of that. All of that was a part of the process. Skinny now? Like doing better. Huh? You skinny now? Not skinny. I'm six seven, three hundred now. That's a lot smaller than when. Yeah, than when I was. I, man, listen, it was bad. Like you would not believe how being in bad mental spaces affects everything with you. Oh, like, I do. <laughs> it's just horrible. And I was like, no, nah, I just can't. I can't keep living. Body's not gonna allow me to keep going like this. When did your mother pass? 2018. 2018, is that what you said? Yeah. And then how long after that did you get into therapy? I wanna say about November. Yeah. Oh, that's pretty good. What were some of the things that were manifesting, the things that you were doing that you were realized were toxic? And it wasn't with the people that I did not care to talk to, it was with people that I love. So my children were, you know, real cautious about approaching me. And I would never forget the one day where my son was like afraid to ask me this. And that bothered me. And I was like, I gotta fix that. that. This has to change because I don't ever want them feeling afraid to ask me or speak to me about anything. That day I sat down and said, I need to feel space. Anybody else, I don't care. Like, you know, people in the streets, they need to feel cautious when approaching me because I like to protect my space. But with them, that door is always open. So that day I remember getting up and saying, I need to get this fixed. I'm not feeling this at all. And so much other stuff going on around me, so much other things happening all at once. And I was like, I gotta stop it before. What was the relationship like with your mom? Had like I love my mom. 
and it took a lot out of me understanding that um, she didn't have all the pieces, but she did what she knew best. She didn't have all the pieces. Yeah, she didn't have every, all the pieces there to like, give me everything that I thought I should be having. So, okay. As I got older as a young man, like I started realizing me becoming a parent, I'm like, I don't have everything. I don't know everything, but I was able to call her and she would always give me the answer. She would always have something to like, you know, direct me in the right path and um, help me be a better father and a better man to my children. Um, losing that, like, that, that, that was big for me. That was major. That was like a key component of my feeling confident. I mean, like everything that I did Added anybody else paid attention to, it, but sharing it with her was like that was the highlight of my life. So she was very proud of you. Yeah, and I, that 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 gave me the drive to like go even farther. Do you feel like you overcompensate in the areas that she undercompensated? Yes. Yes. I see that in myself a lot, and it bothers me. Kids. And and you know, you gotta check yourself sometimes and be like dial it down so because uh overcompensating could spoil the situation. So we wanna make sure that uh to be careful as to how much you're trying to like pacify the situation so your children don't feel that. There's no real gauge or limit, but you gotta pay attention. Because you want your kids to be happy, you wanna love them. Well, I mean, I have no doubt in my mind I'm gonna fuck up my kids. Like, it's just, I think everyone fucks up their kids. I don't, I, I don't know yeah. one person who has kids and their kids grow up and are older and they're like, yeah, well, you know, parents are perfect. I don't think that's possible. No, it's not. I think the best way to combat it, just cause I'm, I'm upset, cause I've done things when I was a child, I've put myself in situations where now as a parent, I'm like, how do I prevent my kid from doing this shit? And I don't know if we, I don't know if I've, I'll ever find the answer, but the closest thing I've found is just practicing communication so that it's natural for your child to communicate when they're in danger or when they feel uncomfortable. That's the closest thing I've found. Absolutely. I, I personally am considering before, you know, things get, you know, they become teenagers like why we were well, teenagers like we were talking about earlier is doing like a monthly family therapy session just so it's normal i don't know would you have done that would your wife have done that with you the kids you'd start at like um, 10. yeah when my teenage son started getting older um i took him I mean, because i he was so withdrawn from so much i can't get certain out of him so I was like, you know, letting him know it's okay to express how you feel about yourself or how you feel about things, it's okay. So taking him to therapy gave him that platform to say, you know, the things he may not feel comfortable saying to me, he can say to someone else. And then, you know, the therapist relaying to me, hey, listen, he's feeling uncertain in certain places, this is what you have to do. Because like I said, I don't have it all. I don't have all the... I may not understand certain things. So you're absolutely right. Having that family time and that structure, um, leave the door open for them to feel comfortable talking to you about anything will help prevent some of the problems, not all of them, because we could do the best that we can as parents and they get older and just choose, you know, the weirdest path. They'd be like, how do you end it? And they won't even know. They just did it. So I understand the concern, not wanting to impose none of those toxic traits or bad habits on them, but that would be the best thing. Opening up that line of communication to break that generational curse that we pass on. Yeah, I think just like you said, I believe in God and I, God gave us free will. Um, 
they're going to do what they're going to do. I just want to make sure that I have paid for and installed the resources that if they do want to get out of it, it's inside them already. I think that that's what, and then accountability is a whole nother thing. Just being able to say sorry and own your shit. I, th I think a lot of people, and especially my generation, don't have that at all. Um, but I want to rewind to what you said about the therapy. This is a hard question. How important, we, we know the stigma with therapy in, in Black culture. How important it is it to have a therapist or a psychiatrist that is also Black? Um, For opening up purposes. For opening up purposes, if you have a tendency to think you know, color or culture is a barrier in how you're feeling mentally, find somebody that you feel comfortable with, um, whether it be Black, I, it doesn't matter to me. My therapist was Asian. And she was awesome. And she made, made me feel comfortable just saying whatever it is I wanted to say. And then um, I didn't feel like I was being judged or looked at. Like so, yeah, like, it, it doesn't matter to me. I know some people are like, oh, what could a white person tell me about my... That, that's not how it goes. I, I, it's about life. I mean, like certain situations that I may go through, that I may experience as a black man, they may not be able to relate to, but that's not my problem. I mean, my problem is, is the result or the trauma or the damage that came from it and how I'm feeling. And that feeling is universal. Like, if I feel awful or my feelings are hurt, you know what, the, if I, have you ever had your feelings hurt? Yeah, you know what that feels like. Now, how do I process it? That's what I need in life. How do I process the situation or learn to get past it? And that was my concern, not whether or not they were, you know, of my culture or skin color. Yeah, I get that a lot. I, a lot of my clients are African American, or so there's a huge Bosnian population here. And then there's also a massive Indian population here. A lot of them own businesses, and a lot of them are my clients. My clients. And if you didn't know, I manage wealth now. Um, and when you manage people's wealth, about 75% of my time is talking to them about their problems. And then like 25% of the time is about like money. So right. the time I go, you need fucking therapy. And yeah. that, that's what I get back a lot is, you know, I'm insert culture, we don't do therapy. And I've always found that um, it's a cop out, but maybe you just need to find someone that can relate more to your unique perspective on the experiences that you have in life. For example, when I did marriage counseling, my husband was like, I don't know if I can sit here and talk to my life in poverty to a white woman. And I was like, okay, well, I'll find a black woman. <laughs> so I went out and I found a black woman. And I didn't create a study to see which one got the more, more information out of him, but it worked out good. So I, I like asking that question. You're the first person I've asked, a person of color that has gone to a white woman. And um, you said it worked out fine. So I'm going to use you uh, in all of my arguments now. So I appreciate that. Hey, listen, it is um, cool, you know what I mean? It is, it is. I, necessary though. I always tell people, you don't put up hurricane shutters during the hurricane, go to therapy. You have right. nothing to lose. Insurance covers it most of the time. Right. And, For and, and, and like you said, accountability is the scariest part for people because they feel as though when they get there, they got to face it. And you do. You do have to face what you're accountable for. And a lot of people can't look in that mirror. It doesn't feel good realizing that, you know, you cause the majority of your own trauma. You know what I mean, and it's all about how you're processing it. Not the fact that it happened, it's gonna happen. Things will happen that you don't like or are unfair to you, but how are you processing? That is the, the part that tears you up and causes you to uh, fracture. And when you don't process it, you just keep sticking band-aids on it or ignoring it over there, that big gaping hole in the wall. I'm gonna just put a poster over it and just act like it's not existing versus saying, let me start fixing that. Let me start patching that up and figuring out how do I not another break like that in my life um people don't want to acknowledge that because it takes work and it 
it takes a lot of hard work to fix that hole. So they're oh, just patch it up. It doesn't exist. You can't tell me how to fix that because you don't know how I got there. But I can tell you it needs to be fixed. And as a business owner and business owners, even what you're doing, that's a lot of you know, baggage to be hearing and collecting all day long. When do you get to unload? Who do you, who do you trust to unload to? Who do you, put, you can't to your spouse sometimes they're dealing with their own problems. And God forbid you got two people that are dealing with traumatic issues and not knowing how to process it. Where do you unload this? Where do you put it at? And that's like the hardest thing for most people, but I've made it my purpose that I don't want to continue living life like that. Like <laughs> overlooking whatever is not good about me, you know, overlooking my thoughts. I'd rather fix it. Yeah, we talked we talked about this in the last episode last week. Um, it was a woman who was a financial coach to women divorcing their husbands that were kept out of the finances because she herself had been through financial abuse. And um, one thing we talked about is it's really hard work, you know, unveiling it, but it's also pretty painful because you're reliving stuff sometimes for the first time because at least most people's minds to deal with trauma, specifically painful trauma, is that they just bury it. So when you have to unload it, you have to feel it. And that's- it up. That sucks. So that brings me to my first question. Do you think everyone feels failure in the same way? No. Um, I used to say this a lot. Like that was used to be one of my biggest things. Like I don't want to fail because that feeling of disappointment was like horrible. Like, oh man, it hurts. And it's like, what do you do with that? Now, as I got older, I started embracing my failure. So now it feels good when I fail because then I know what not to do the next time. I know, all right, that's not the path. I need to try another one. And then I get even more excited because I feel I'm going to fail 100, 200, 300 times but I'm gonna get it right one time. And when I get it right, well, that's it. It's on from there, there forward. So I, I seek failure because I wanna know how to do it right now. So I'm not afraid of it anymore. It's like, I wanna be there. I've never done anything in my life and not had failing moments. So a lot of people process failure different. Some people fail and they go hide because that feeling of disappointment, they don't wanna experience, it's a bad one. Um, some people fail and they, it, it excites them because they're doing something and they know, okay, it was an error, I'll fix it. Some people get angry about it and then, you know, they start placing blame on other people and other things. Um, yeah, it's all about what you do. Do you think um, that ca- that's kind of what separates the haves and the haves nots? I, I take I take examples of trying not to get too personal and call anyone out here so I'm going to word this correctly um like I've noticed in my own family how death affects even in your own situation I'm sure you can point to someone in your family how death affects the motivation of people if that makes sense so like for my husband when his mother died it was like I gotta make it now I have to make it, I have to make it for her. And then there's other people where it was like, this is going to forever be the reason why I don't get out of this hole. Right, right. It happens. I remember when my mother passed, I, like I lost all drive. Like, I I didn't want to tattoo, I didn't want to draw anything. I didn't want to do nothing. And I will always tell people, Colors just seem different. Nothing seems the same. So even drawing, like, nothing looked the same. Everything was just different. So that's how I know it was just like a lot of other things that was just needed to be handled. But something clicks, something goes off, and you gotta do it. It's like, I gotta get through this. And if I don't get through it, um, other people. 
knowing that I have so many people relying on me to do so many things, primarily my children. Um, but fuck that. What if you didn't have your children? I'd have to find them. But it was it's so many other people, so many other things outside of them that relies on me. Like, you had nothing that relied on you. You still think you think you would have sat there? No. Nah. Because nah. then I, at, at the point that I'm at now where it's like this self-love thing, I love myself to say I got to do something. Oh, that was cute. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, yeah, I just think that some people have the ability to overcome and and some don't. And it's it's fascinating devastating both of those things i don't ha i i just i've always wondered what is it that keeps people in that spot um i feel like i know what you're going to say but what was a failure in your life that hit you so hard it altered the trajectory of your life had you gone one way you've been in a completely different situation right now Mm -hmm. A failure that hit you so hard, you could have gone one way and been in a totally different version of yourself than you are now. I feel like your mom is going to be the one you were going to say, because that maybe in the recent past is the most influential one. But that's not a failure. How would you have failed with that? The only thing I, I, I could have said felt like a failure now it's like damn I wish you were here so you could see all the things that I was just telling you I'm getting to and I didn't do it sooner like that haunts me like I was right there mom I was right there and I need you to see this like I was telling you about this and we would always talk about these different things I would tell her you know when I buy another home I'm gonna get the bigger backyard and she was like yeah, I'm gonna plant a garden and I'm gonna do this and we talk about all these things and I'm like we're gonna do it we're gonna do it and it didn't happen that so that's like the only thing that like links us with but as far as failures there's so many different ways I could have went in life um me being here is just a success in itself especially knowing where I came from and how I grew up and you know me being here is enough so in my failures, I found success. Pick one. Pick one that someone can learn from as it relates to your business. Empire Tattoos. I'm sure you've, in some sense, failed there. Yes, plenty of times. I mean, there's been sleepless nights where uh, I, I'm just not sure. One thing I will always say in business is I'm not going to fail. You're going to make these mistakes. Make sure you protect your time. Protect your time. Uh, and guard it because you'll have people around you and things that will consume it. And you can't get it back. And the money part is cool. That's the byproduct of putting in that time. But when you lose that time to certain situations and certain things that you cannot get back, uh, it bothers you. It lingers with me. It bothers me a lot. So manage your time well. Um, keep like-minded people around you. Be careful of the type of people that you keep around you because there's some real blood suckers out there and they will play you. They'll play you close. Like, I, one thing that I learned in business is I know somebody that doesn't like me. If they don't like me and they're clear on it, I'm fine with that person because I'm clear that you don't like me. It's the people that are around me that are and you're like play me that way and I know you don't like those are the people that escape because they're capable of doing god awful things because they're willing to play that role just to get close enough to do whatever they whatever they feel whatever they please so you gotta be careful with the people that you keep around you um I wish I would have uh, been more aware of you know financial literacy I got into the business when I was and there was so many mistakes happening. I mean, so many things that I just did not know about, did not I know how to do, wasn't aware of, and it cost me. So 
make sure you have an account. Huh? Looking back, what are some of those things on the financial side? Um, getting contracts in place, knowing that, uh, you know, your business shares, if you have business partners, making sure you have contracts in place that stick what you're obligated to and what they're obligated to. Um, knowing the difference between an investment and a, uh, like a buy-in, like somebody that's buying in to be a partner with you, knowing the difference between the two. Um, Hiring an accountant, making sure you have an accountant to uh, tell you what what you're doing with your money or how you're spending it. Um, saving, it was weird. Like I always thought, oh, you gotta save, you gotta save, you gotta save, and then you have this money stacked up there and it's doing nothing for you. It's just sitting there, and then I'm like, this doesn't it doesn't feel good because eventually it's gonna get spent. Somebody's gonna spend it for me. So. What do I do with this money? Learning about investments, learning about you know 401k, learning about Roth, like all these different things. I wish I had those tools earlier, so I could have let my money work for me. Versus so piled up, huh? There's so many people. Because most of my clients are small business owners, and they're I would say majority of them come in and they've. You know, it's like a side hustle. They still have a primary job, but they're making money and they come in and they're so proud to show me their checking statement. And they'll have like 200, 300 grand in there. And it's just, they're like, look, look at all the money I've made. I was like, like, damn, look at all the money I haven't made in the last three years. Exactly. But it's just sitting there. Uh, it's it's education. It's it's a ledge. It's a accountability. I, we fear what we don't know. Like you said it best, there's so many different types of accounts that are built for small businesses to hide, maybe hide's not the best word, but to avoid paying taxes on it. They exist. In fact, our tax code is built for the small business owner. Our country is built. There's so many loopholes for the business owner. And if you have an accountant and you have a financial professional, but Fuck that. A lot of people can't afford us. So what do they do? That's not an excuse anymore. There's so much free shit. And it's so much free right shit. There in front of you. It's like right there. Clubhouse. Clubhouse. Yep. I mean, I just discovered Clubhouse probably six months ago. If you have an iPhone and you are just tweedledee, tweedledum, you can go on Clubhouse and you can type in finance and get into a room and for two hours there will be a group of experts sitting there telling you everything you need to do right. i mean there's no excuse anymore now what when when i knew you came into empire tattoos that stuff wasn't really like i mean it was there but it i feel like it wasn't as right like it wasn't as popular just like go on clubhouse like it was there wasn't a ton of like oh yeah like, i don't think it was more like a site with Wait, Clubhouse I, was around 10 years ago? Huh? Clubhouse was around 10 years ago? I don't think it was called Clubhouse. They had a, a, a like an app. I remember an app like that. Like, like it was a chat room. And you get in there and people just be shit talking all day. And I don't want to say it just not what's happening. It was an app that had that. And I just never understood the purpose. Well, now we do, looking back on it. But you said some powerful, some powerful shit right there. So that's Yes, an accountant. Going back, rewinding to the snakes in the grass conversation we're having. As small business owners, this happens, in any business, this happens all the time, all the time. One of my good friends owns a spa here in Jacksonville. God, I'm probably gonna get in trouble for saying this, whatever. She owns a spa here in Jacksonville. Her best friend was a manager and was paying herself double paycheck every single time. Money, I'm gonna tell you this right now, two things that I've, I, I've personally watched people like shit on people for, sex and money. Those two things right there, I've I watched family members like shit on this one. And it's just, it's, it's a simple conversation. You want more money? Talk about it. I, some people just can't have those conversations, but I, I will say i i think i was just born with this monumental pile of 
guilt and shame. Like if I do something <laughs> wrong, it eats at me. And right. you might not even know, but I'm going to have to tell you. Otherwise, I'm not going to be able to sleep or eat for days. It's Thanks. a good thing, but it's also like stupid shit makes me get that feeling to where I can't eat and sleep. And then I have to like randomly tell you, hey, like I ate half your Subway sandwich. <laughs> nice. I wasn't going to tell you. And I <laughs> well, it's like that half that that's me. Please forgive me. <laughs> Forgive me. I know you I know you forgot about it, but here we are. Um, it's hard for me to understand that type of betrayal, especially when it comes to hurting someone, uh, someone else's pockets, like taking money or so, something like that. It's, I can't understand it. So because you have had more experiences like that in business than me, what's in most of the viewers that, that will be watching this? What is your advice on how to kind of identify those red flags? Um, first thing first, like I said, always understand people's intention. You know, what are they there for? They'll tell you, you know, like, all right, for instance, we go through tons of artists. When I interview people now, I ask them, like, what is their purpose here? And the minute it starts gearing towards the idea that, you know, it might be slow for them outside, place to post up at to gather more clients, get them out of the way. Before it used to be it's open door policy. Hey, come on in, you want a tattoo? Hey, let me see your work. Hey, you can do the work, have a seat. And then they would gather up clients and before you know it, I'm looking, I'm like, where are they at? And where's the clients that was coming to me? Then took them back to the house. And I'm like, how does that work? That doesn't make any sense. Um and it's just not right. And I would tell them that you know you're taking money not only out of the shop but everybody else's mouth and they wouldn't care they'd be like, these are my folks so these are my clients you gotta be certain of people's intent before you sit down with them before you even invite them to that table you gotta make sure they're bringing something to the table of substance and it makes a difference with everybody else that's sitting at that table once somebody comes to that table and all they got is a take-home plate you can't sit here Go sit over there at the kitty table and tell I'm ready to give you what I think you need or what I feel as though you should have. Um, and being firm on it. I mean, I got such a big heart for people that they know it. And they will hang around and be around and it's just to figure out what resources could they exhaust from me. And then when I'm depleted, I'm looking like, all right, I need to catch back up. What do we got going on? And everybody will be like, we. <laughs> got that problem i'm good so then it's like okay i gotta start paying attention to um people's intent making sure you're very certain as to what they're there for what their role is and um keeping everything in check like don't ever let people uh, play over you or play around you because they will do it as long as they feel as though they got that outlet or the ability to, to take from you they're gonna do it i have to learn the art of no telling people no and setting boundaries that I was firm on. And that kept a lot of people away. They'll tell you right now, oh, Josh, he, oh, he, he gonna say no, so I ask him. You're damn right, because I already know what you're here for. What is the answer you want to hear to that question? What, what are they here for? Yeah, when you're asked, when you're interviewing someone. Honestly, the truth, tell me the truth. If you're here for a check, all right, cool. I know how to handle you. If you're here because you want to be a part of a growing team and you want to help the business grow, then I know how to handle you. Now, are they being honest? I don't know, I have to see how they perform. But once you tell me what your intention is, and I see you do something left or right of what you said it is, that's it. You've now got my undivided attention and I am going to get rid of you or figure out what I need to do with you to get what I need out of the situation. Specifically in the tattooing industry, how do you incentivize these people to stay to reduce turnover? Um, I learned this much being a owner of the You got bosses, you got Everybody wants to be the boss of the check company. That's a quote that I always hear and I, I stand by. People come in here and I do what they do. I tattoo, they tattoo. I can do the same thing. Um, the clients that come through the store, that's why it's not named Jaws or anything related to myself because it's a collective group of people doing one thing for one 
common goal, a happy customer. I want the people walking out of here saying they had a great experience. So you already knew how it was, it was a vibe in here. So whenever they get there or any artist gets here, I figure out who they are and what they are. If they're like boss material and I feel as though, you know, they don't need to be working on this structure, I literally would try and like, hey, we got another shop for opening, you can manage this location and your incentive would be this. And that would work better for them. Um, the majority of people you come across, they're worried. You got to give them structure. You got to give them structure. You got to tell them this is what it is and this is what you'll get if you do this. And once you give them that structure and they see it's working, they'll stick from here until forever. They will stick with it. But you got to be able to gauge out what kind of person you're doing. For a manager, do you do salary? How do you structure their pay? Uh, percentages. Everybody gets different percentages based on uh, you know, the turn of how much money they're bringing in and uh, the position that they hold. If they're not bringing in a certain amount of money or whatever the case may be, you know, they're penalized for it or they just don't get anything. There's incentives for everything that they do, but it has to have a structure to it. Like, I can't just say, oh yeah, you bring this in, I'll give you this. Are you coming to work on time? business, are you bringing clients in, all of these things back to them. If they want it, they're going to do it. If not, they just sit down there and just do regular and they get whatever they get regularly. Yeah, that's something I'm, I'm, I've always done a base structure because my business is different, right? You're going to be doing paperwork, you're going to be doing follow-up, you're going to be doing outreach, but then you can bring in people yourself. You can, um, for, for follow-up with prospects, for example, I always give them a percentage if they become a client. I'm a firm believer in everyone watching this, no matter what your business is, you have to have at least a component in your payroll uh, that's eat what you kill. So the, it's called a bonus structure. That should go with absolutely every bit, small business growth. Because at the end of the day, payroll, marketing and payroll are my biggest expenses. Absolutely. Biggest. And I still got to pay. If you're hourly, I still got to pay you even if right now the market's down. I'm making, I mean, if the market's down 20%, exactly. guess what? I'm, what I'm you making 20%. I still got to pay your ass. Right. So I think that, um, I'm sure for some, some type of businesses, like if you have an assistant who's just like, you can't necessarily do an eat what you kill structure, but for something that has a lot of turnover. And right now it's hard to hire. I mean, I only want someone that's gonna hustle, but not everyone. I think we've glamorized business ownership a lot. I don't know if this has always been the case or if it's just been the case in the last few years. Everyone wants to own their own business. Everyone right. wants to be an entrepreneur, but um, you're gonna work more. <laughs> 10 times. If, 10 if times. Any of the artists that were here that went on to like, oh, I'm just gonna own my own business because they felt this was easy. I'm pretty sure like, ask them now, how does it feel? They would, they would sit down there and understand, damn job. I get it, I get it. It, it is, uh, it's a ton of work. And I leave my house and I always say, I'm going to my other house. Like I, I, well, I said, I'm gonna see my other children. Because you get in here, it's so much complaining, whining, hissing and moaning. Somebody's upset, somebody's happy, somebody's angry. Customers are pissed, something. It's always something to do. It's never a moment when you come in here and it's just, cool, everything's running smooth. And then not only that, now you gotta maintain the business and you're constantly setting out fires. You put that fire out, we gotta get this in order, we gotta get the, keep the team structure in place, camaraderie, all these different things. Um, and then you turn around, damn, inventory, this, that. It's always something to do. And not only that, now you're trying to make sure your money's coming in and the money's not coming in, now you're stressing your bills and you're it's just, it's chaos. That's an area where I could get better is that I, I, I'll have, I have a to-do list every single day and my goal is to get through that to-do list, but I rarely do because you come in and there's so many things that are you, that you could not have planned for. Right. And what I am now working on in my business is delegation, economical delegation. So I plan on hiring a COO because I don't I don't really care if you're gonna take the day off, but I need to have it I need to have it recorded somewhere so that I'm someone's making sure that out of the ten days that you get off, now you have seven. 
Um, I don't really, I, I, I do what I do because I'm good at it and because I like meeting with people and I love researching the stock market. I don't like firing. I don't like interviewing. I don't like the confrontation of, you said you were going to do that. Why didn't you do that? Right. That's, that's delegation uh, at its finest. Maybe you are meant for that, but have you ever considered like a COO, a third party COO? Um, right now, everything is internal. Uh, before, it just used to be me walking in, dealing with everybody. Now I have manager okay. and I tell them and I you know I had to set the hierarchy with the artists because they were so used to coming to unload their stuff on me and I'm like listen tell the manager the manager let me know what you can do. if the manager could handle it they'll handle it so they'll just let me know the things that must be handled by me or my business are and all of your managers tattooists tattooers uh one's in the piercing department to and I like it that way because they can relate to what's going on versus hiring somebody outside that knows nothing about the industry or what's being said or what's going on. I'd rather have somebody in terms of that knows what's happening, what you know, what I expect, what I don't like, and um, they know what to bring back to me and what they can and cannot. Hear. What's some um, advice that you can glean? from failures that you've experienced with partnerships? Um, partnerships are something you gotta be very clear on. In the beginning, you gotta be very clear on the beginning. Um, you learn a lot. I mean, I got a business partner and he serves his purpose in his own right. And I serve mine. But you have to be very clear about what you expect from each other and not assume because he could assume that hey he's gonna come in and do the tattoo day in and day out and I could assume that he's gonna come in and do this or that and it's gonna just be done. You gotta have those expectations from the beginning. Very clear on them. Um, it's business, it's not personal. And be clear on the business aspect of things that all of this stuff needs to be on paper. All of this stuff needs to make sense um, for both parties. So nobody's walking away disappointed. A lot of relationships um, go bad. Whether it's friendship, relationship, go bad when you got two people trying to be a partner in a business and they're siding together, they're doing it together, and then they realize it stresses that out. Then somebody's feeling obligated to more, or somebody's expecting more, and then things change. If that person doesn't want to change person doesn't see it this way. You've got to be able to have these ground rules from the beginning to know how things are going to go. Or you could ruin a good business. I mean, with, with bad partnership, bad management, you could destroy a business within seconds. Everything that you work hard for, it just takes a couple bad instances with poor management, your business can go to shit. you got to be firm on it. Yeah, and you can protect those interests. It's called a buy-sell agreement with insurance contracts so you can buy each other out. And I highly recommend that people do that correct the first time because especially if it's a business that you've grown and now you're bringing in an investor because you want to take that next scale upward and you just gave vested interest to someone who has who can destroy or play a hand in destroying something that you've created from the ground up. I've seen it happen too many times and it's, it's heartbreaking. I guess that's a failure in itself and you can always start over if you have the, the foundation and the knowledge to do so, but a lot of people don't come back from that. Yeah, it, it could go bad. So, and also having like an open mind communication with your partner as far as the expectation goes, um, that helps because a lot of people uh, have these business relationships trouble. They grumble about them, they let them stew, they let them fester, and they become like a handsome sword. And then the intent is to either destroy or, you know, disregard how you're feeling about anything or what you want to do about something. And then the relationship is toxic. And at that point, it's, it's doomed. Like, it's not going to work. So having those open lines of communication with each other 
and being, like I said, I can't stress it enough, being clear about each other's intent, purpose, and obligation is important. So if you don't do it, you're gonna run into it. Head first, years down the line. Any deal, any partnership, anything that you get into, any contractual agreement with anybody, make sure you are so clear on it. Uh, um, and it's on paper. Nothing verbal. I, I learned my lesson doing those verbal agreements. No more. Everything must be either text it to me, email it to me, or send it to me on paper so I could get it. I mean, it's as simple as simple as on paper. Uh, in my CEO focus group, it's called an LOI. Literally anything written in a word document, yep. <laughs> signed, <laughs> is a binding contract. That is I, it. I would even go beyond a text message because you can always have some asshole say, "Oh, that wasn't me." We're talking to me, even on an email. You have that shit signed on a piece of paper, laminated, put in a safe. DocuSign is dope. I got I got an account with them. I love DocuSign. I DocuSign everything. But right even now. then, even then, you can still have someone say, Oh, I didn't sign that. That wasn't me, unless you have them physically do their signature. Um yeah, that's I have a lot of LOIs. One thing, another thing that I'm I'm improving at and that I think a lot of people, a lot of my clients have have asked for feedback on and I can't give it to them because I'm I'm not good at it yet is firing people. I'm sure you've had to fire people in your time as a business owner. <laughs> what are some tips and tricks that you've learned from failing at firing? You leave a cancer in long enough, it will contaminate everything. So, like I said, I have a big heart and it used to be like I would tolerate people to a certain extent because I would hope they could work it out. I'd be like, listen. That's me. You know, I'll, I'll, right, I'll have the talk with you, you know. And then at some point I'm like, I'm not your father, I ain't your mother. I, I don't have to have this talk, this is business. You're starting to cause a problem and now everybody else is being affected by it, my business is being affected by it. And now if I gotta get phone calls about you every day, now, you move the wrong way and irritate me the wrong way. And my goal business, my time, you interrupt the amount of time that I have to use for something else, I would get rid of it quick because I don't have time for that. I, I, I don't want to have to keep talking about the same thing. And another thing, do not hire friends, do not hire family members, do not hire them. I do not do not hire any friends or family members to be employees of your business or work with you in your business unless it is so clear that if they did this, that, and that, this will equal termination. And they are so absolutely clear on it and they're willing to accept it. Because I used to have a habit of hiring people that I know, like, oh yeah, I know you're gonna do me more. And then they get in here and it's chaos. I'm like, why are you behaving this way? Because they feel as though, oh, you know me, so you're not gonna get rid of me. And I've had to let people at times like, sorry, you gotta go. Because you're not working for the needs of the business. I mean, you're working off this person thing and they'll, they'll come and tell me, oh, you treat me like I'm a random person. You're an employee. <laughs> and nobody, when I look at your paycheck, you're an employee in this department. And everybody gets the same check. The only difference is the amount of hours you work. So I'm not looking at as uh, John Doe and that's my friend, so I'm gonna take you know special care of you. No, you work for your hours, you're getting paid. This is how the department needs to run and work. This is what I'm expecting from you. If you cannot provide that and you cannot do that, I will make way for somebody else to do it. And I'm sorry you guys don't. So it's a conversation. It is, it definitely is. I, I try not to be that abrupt boss to come in and be like, oh, you're fired for no reason. It usually gears up to it. Like, I'll have that conversation. I've given written warnings. I, I've, I've learned about all those things. I was like, why are you giving me a written warning? Because it's to prevent those situations where one of people could sue you for wrongful termination and those things like that, and it's real. Um, once I start giving you verbal and written warnings and stuff like that. And I'm telling you, this is the track record I have for you. When it comes time for you to go out the door, most most terminations that I've had, they knew it was coming. 
Because when I'm telling them it's done, they're like, all right, I know. You know what I mean? Because I didn't spoke to you so many times, it's not going to be a fourth or fifth time. So you got to go. You know you're not working for the business. You're not meeting the requirements. So there's somebody else that wants to do it. You got to leave. Now, I got certain situations where you're terminating people and then they get violent and they get angry and they get upset. Like, you know, how could you? But I can tell you exactly how I gave you two verbals, three written warnings, and, and spoke to you a couple times and you're not responding. So you got to go. So you do believe in in warnings, whether they yeah. were whether written or verbal. You, So where I struggle is I've made mistakes. I know I'm a good person. This is probably not, this is exactly what you're saying not to do. Um, but I tried to see everything from an employee's perspective because I've been an employee before. But that's what gets you in trouble. So like I've, I've had issues in the past where I, I take it to my focus group and they're like, fire them, fire them. I have to have with them. And they're like, stop. When, once someone shows you what they're about, get rid of them. But I, I don't know how I feel about that yet. Maybe I just haven't gotten burned enough. Um, I, I believe in investing in people and taking that risk, but I, it seems like everyone Think about it this way, right? You got an employee that's disgruntled and not doing their job. You just sat down there and told me you have a list of things you really can't tackle in a day. So that means your time is very tied up between being, you know, family and business. Your time is dedicated to certain things. When you have to take 30 minutes, an hour, two hours to either fix an employee's mistake or what they're ignoring or what they're not doing. And then you got to take another 30 minutes or an hour to have a conversation to tell them to do the job that they're well aware of. It's costing you. It's yeah. costing you by the hour. Now, I don't know your rates, or what you're charging people, but you know your hourly work whenever you're dealing with people. And these are employees. So if you want to level down with them as an employee, think about it. How much time you're taking to keep trying to talk this person through their job and they know what it is. Like, if you want to do that, just go ahead and send me the money for free. <laughs> no, you're right. You're right. You're right. I also think that hiring right now is where I where I could do better is hiring more people. I think that overstaffing is better than being understaffed. It's hard Absolutely. right now, but I've learned that it's better to have people that are asking you what they can do than to be me having to go into the office on a Saturday and do shit because I think also with you yours is different right you don't have work from home a lot of my employees work from home so it's it's hard it's hard to level with them and be, and be like am I giving them too much work am I giving them not enough I mean you can ask them but they're always gonna be like no I'm good no I'm good so I think that measuring for, for people that are listening that have stay-at-home employees, which is very common right now after COVID. I don't know if that's even possible for you. You can't have stay-at-home employees. Nah, you gotta nah. be hand -hand without you have to You have to measure that. I, setting deadlines has been a really valuable lesson for me is nobody can fake a deadline. The work's done on Friday or it's not done on Friday. And someone needs to have an explanation on why it's not done. Right. I that those milestones are incredibly important. To, to see if someone's doing what they're supposed to be fucking doing. Right. But the, one of the biggest concerns I have with my clients that own small businesses is how do I fire? How do I fire? But I guess it's just throwing a pair of balls and having that conversation. It's called effective immediately. That's what it is. You really gotta say your fire is effective immediately. The services are no longer needed. Thank you for everything that you've done. Thanks for asking the third. Um, if it's one of those terminations where you don't mind giving them, hey, I'll give you a reference for another job that suits you, or it could be one of those things, you know, you're intelligent, you know how to politely say fuck. Like, <laughs> we could, you know, you worded how you need to package it, you just put it in a bow and you let them go with it and I'm fired, effective immediately. You know what I mean, and that's just how it is because playing with your time and not being able to get those minutes or hours back, that hurts, I'm not gonna lie to you, it hurts because you invest so much time into people hoping that they're gonna come out on the other end and it's gonna be such a team thing, like, you know, we're all a team here. And then they could turn around and burn you, like, bad. 
bad, you're missing deadlines for projects and things that you know is uh, important. I mean, this, this could be hundreds of thousands of dollars or whatever it is that you need to get done and it missed the deadline because what? My goldfish died, uh, you know, I had to help my grandmother find her dentures, something that's only related to them and not the need for the business. It's called effectively. What's the worst you've ever been burned by an employee? Or an um, partner in general? Worst I've ever been burned. I would sit down and say, is this people backdooring anybody? I've had people work in my establishment and then turn around and rather than say, let's have this conversation and work together. They're trying to work against me. And they're like, oh yeah, I'm gonna go set up shop right down the block. Right down the block. And it's just like, why would you do that? Because in their mind, you know, either I'm gonna do this better than you, or you're the reason you're, I'm here. That's how they feel. Like, I'm the reason you're here. And it's just like, they got it so twisted. They got it so backwards. Um, I am not the reason. It's a collective group of people I'm here, everybody else is here. And I do what you do. That's why I tell them what it's It's never a thing where I'm just, oh yeah, I'm facilitating a, a, a studio and I don't know nothing about what you're going through. I do what you do. And many a times I've gotten in the trenches with my soldiers and, you know, back to back, I'm, I'm with them. And I'm I letting them know. Huh? Whatever you type. Yeah, like I, I'd be in there. So to have them turn around and be like, well, you know, I can't have my way or you're not going to give me whatever I want or I'm not agreeing with certain things. I'm going to go down the block and I'm going to try and shut you down. I'm like, no, man, like, that's how you're going. Like, you have to do that. And, and feel comfortable. I mean, um, dealing with people taking things from you, I mean, that, that's right through yours and feeling as though you're not obligated to it. Or you don't deserve it. You know, pocket watch and stuff like that. Like, those are some of the I, it's made me who I am now and how I deal with you. I mean, I'd rather not deal with you if um, I got to think too hard about who you are. I feel like it's made you more bitter. My mom always yeah, says just, to me, you're going to get more bitter <laughs> as you get older. It, I won't even say it's bitter because bitter would mean you're angry. Like, you, you just, you're frustrated with that. So I don't want to deal with it. No, it's just like, I know what I don't want to experience again. And I'm certain on this boundary. That's it. I'm not even treading along that line. I'm focused over here. And bitterness would be me staring at that boundary and like, I wish I could cross it. I have no desire to cross it. I have no desire to even mingle in that area. It's there for a reason. I'm focused on this. Don't even look at me if you're over there. And that's how it's been lately. And people are like, you know, I'm very uh, withdrawn from a lot of folks. And it's for a reason because people could be real shit. Yes, they can. Yes, they can. And I that's coming back from experiences like that, especially as a business owner, it's so important that we support each other. I don't feel like there's enough. I mean, we have clubhouse and stuff, but it's always one person talking about how to be successful. It's very rarely one person who's ahead of everyone else talking about their mistakes and preventing other intentionally preventing other people from committing the same mistakes. And that was the premise for this entire podcast is, I'm sick of seeing everyone's perfect lives on Instagram, no matter how much money you have, no matter what your situation is, you have fucking problems. A lot. And we should be helping each other, especially as business owners, because we are the foundation of American capitalism. We are what makes the engine run. We have to support each other, especially going into a recession over the next couple of years. So. Thank you. I appreciate you more than you know. Um, if people want to reach out to you, ask questions, how would you prefer that they reach out to you? Um, they could look me up on Instagram, Facebook. Uh, either one is fine. What's your Insta? Uh, Instagram is W-H-A-S-M. W-H-K-S-M-U.
beautiful. I'll tag that in there. Again, much love. Good luck Appreciate on the Empire Podcast. That's you too. You too. I like what you're doing here. I'm, I'm proud of you. I'm proud Thank of you. I'm gonna definitely hit you up because I, I need some insight into some things. I know you that part of. Uh, yeah. So I definitely I'm doing that for the last nine years. I'm getting old. I'm aging my hair. How old are you right now? I'm 29 years old. Oh my god. Oh my god. You're not even 30 no, yet. What? You're not even 38. You're talking about you're old. I feel old. How so? I don't know. I guess I just started doing everything so early. Like I, I graduated when I was 20 and then went right into business, got licensed, and I've been doing it ever since. Then I got married, had two kids in two. That's what you're supposed to do. So guess what? When you get my age, the kids are old what enough. are you? Feed themselves up. Right. That's, I should be dead right now. That's how you're looking at it, right? <laughs> yeah. But it's like, like you, know, you get my age, now your kids are self-sufficient. They'll be able to feed themselves. Your business is, uh, God's willing to be thriving and on its own. And you'll probably be on the beach somewhere chilling while your business is running without you having to be there because you've been hired. That so sounds many- nice. I, th- I do think it'll be easier once my once my kids need me less because I as a woman working this much, you have this constant guilt. And I mean, if one more fucking person tells me you're gonna miss these years, like I'm gonna I'm gonna die. I'm but, not gonna lie, you're gonna have a mo- you're gonna have one of those moments where you're looking at them and you can no longer pick them up, and it's gonna hit you. Gonna hit you. I know, I know it is, but I don't need the constant reminder that I'm foregoing time with my kids to build a successful business. I'm trying to be super present when I'm present. And, and that's 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 your healthy balance that you have to figure out. You'll get it. I mean, as long as you're happy with it and they're happy with you, that's all that matters. That's all that matters. Because they know mom has to work. Super mom. Well, I also think that you know. It's good, especially so you have everything your kids don't want for anything. And if they do, it's because you're denying them something. It's not because you can't get it. And we have the same lifestyle. My kids are growing up where we have housekeepers and they have a nanny and they, we have a, a chef. So how how do I teach them how to work hard? Because in my generation specifically, People don't know how to work hard anymore. Everyone wants to own a business, but they don't know how to fucking grind. Right. They don't know how to put their head down and work. They don't know how to, they don't know how to work for 24 straight hours. They don't know how to hit deadlines. They don't know how to prioritize or delegate. Um, uh, work is in bosses. Work is in bosses. That's it. They, but I think that your kids seeing that shit is important. It is. It is important because guess what? They're not gonna grow up. Um, feeling entitled too much. They know that their, their mom's working, their pops are working. So they're going to start mimicking those traits. And the, the, the same way they grew up is what they're going to expect when they get older. So they're going to figure it out. And they're going to have to figure it out if they want to maintain that lifestyle. That's See, a good way of putting it. Right. Growing up in poverty, a lot of people get accustomed to it and they get comfortable with it and they become complacent. And they say, well, you know what? This is how life is. When you have certain people that come out of that and say, I don't want to live like that. Or I don't want to give that to my children. You bust your ass to get something better to show them that I don't ever want you experiencing these moments here to change that generation. Curve. So some people are so concerned with them. They don't, they're, they're going to learn. Trust me. They're going to learn what you're doing right now is perfect for them because they're going to want it when they get older and they're going to keep doing what they have to do to sustain that lifestyle of the nanny cook it they're gonna want it when they get older and they're gonna keep doing it yeah i never looked at it like that like they're going it's not about obviously they're spoiled and they have things which we're so thankful for for that i feel like they're gonna watch us and be like i'm being crude or arrogant i'm not <laughs> thankful thank god multiple times a day for that's a beautiful thing but i'm constantly concerned about not making them shitty people but you're right if they want to have these things we can't afford to keep them on the payroll till they're 62 so right they're gonna have to go out and get it. Perfect. Or they're gonna figure out that it's just come to you, but. Mom's a hustler, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure you're gonna point them in the right direction. 
I'm going to try, but huge shout out. Thank you. I'm going to go to bed now and I hope you do too. I got more work to do. Damn. All right. Good, good way to end. He's got more work to do. Yeah.